great interviewing you on the radio, but to be with you in person is even better. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for doing the interview. Yeah, I'm really happy to be talking to you. How's the tour going? The tour's been going really great. Machine Head is a great band. Um, play them on my station. And, and uh, Suicide Silence is a new band that a lot of people are, are finding a lot of interest in. And, and um, the uh, guys in the opening band, uh, Arcadium, very interesting band too. I like the front man. He's very, very, very timid backstage. When he gets out on stage, he, he really, you know, besides the fact he looks like he weighs about 80 pounds, he, he really has got a great persona. And I was surprised. So I, I think that band's going to have some good things if he eats a couple of cheeseburgers, you know. Endgame, uh, it's getting just incredible reviews everywhere. I was in a coffee shop today and just opened up the Dallas Observer and there were two just raving reviews saying it's one of your best albums ever and they're really avant-garde. What is the message of Endgame? Well, a lot of people thought that that was uh, signifying the end of my career because, you know, I've got issues with my, my uh, skeletal manners and stuff like that, uh, with head banging and stuff. And, um, with the way that the music business is right now, with the record companies finally getting what they deserve, um, it's uh, it's interesting because the music industry is is falling as quickly as you know what, what we're talking about. You know, that watching again, it's corporate greed in America because it's all the big conglomerate record companies, and you know, like for example, EMI is owned by Thorn, from what I know, and they make the Warhead. So um, you know, there's a lot of weirdness with who owns the record labels and stuff like that. I love EMI, but I had no idea. I talked to Jello Biafra from the Dead Kennedys, and I asked him to do a side project with me, and he goes, no way, man, you're on EMI. Those guys make bombs. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I had no idea. And of course, he told me the Oldsmobile made machine guns for the Nazis, too, and stuff like that, which totally tripped me out, but I had no idea. Well, pretty much everything, in one way or another, is a subsidiary of the military-industrial complex. It's been like that since the days of Eisenhower. So, I mean, as long as the message is getting out, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's actually to the anger of the establishment. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I had a guy from the UN actually called me up. If you can, well, not call me up, but he said something about United Abominations, and it, this shows how pea brain this guy was. He, at the very end, after he tried to say to discredit me, he says, "Besides, I'm a Metallica fan, anyways." And I thought. What a twat, you know, because I, I mean, you know, I am part Metallica, so what are you saying? That's like going up to somebody who's mulatto and saying they don't have white or black in them, you know. I am part Metallica, so for him to say that, it just shows you why the, you know, most of the people up there don't know what they're doing, because, you know, you have people that are representing stuff, saying childish things like that. That's sandbox mentality, you know what I mean? <laughs> Talk about endgame. You talk about these greedy, corrupt mega corporations. Uh, from your own research, what do you believe their endgame is? Uh, well, I, I believe it's the same thing you and I both believe. Me as a Christian, I believe that it's one world government, one world currency, and uh, you know, it's it's part of my belief. Uh, I said so in in Holy Wars. You know, it's part of the master plan. It's what I believe. I ascribe to that when I became a Christian. I know that there's going to be a, a, a cataclysmic. Uh, ramping up of all of these things that we're seeing right now and, and it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse and we're watching our country disintegrate right now and it's scary you know when I start thinking that I'm gonna be moving with Sean Drover back up to Canada that's scary 
you know, and, and uh, that's what Endgame is all about. It's about educating our fans and showing them a little bit about what's going on within the previous administration. And, you know, uh, things haven't changed at all. And it, it's just more of this whole um, people being run by the, the people who have the money. something that when we had the dollars before and it had red ink on it yes tell me that story i had heard that that was kennedy was supposed yeah, no, to that's true. he was going to get rid of the federal reserve mm -hmm. and he made the money with red ink and that's part of my mm -hmm. like, you can go into any coin shop dave uh, and say i want a lincoln greenback issued by kennedy mm -hmm. and you'll probably have to pay 20 30 dollars for it because it's a collector and they'll go under the counter and they'll pull it out and it has a red seal but more importantly and it was only fives he only issued the first four billion and when you read on the top of it, it says United States note. Nowhere does it say Federal Reserve. So it was yeah. pre-1913 when the private banks took over. And he signed the executive order to fully phase out, because he didn't want to do it overnight, mm -hmm. because that would cause some problems, mm -hmm. to fully phase out the private banks that had taken over the issuance of currency and credit. Mm -hmm. And from uh, talking to you know, all the top real researchers on JFK, it wasn't making the decision to pull it out of Vietnam. That was part of it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the decision to stop trying to have war with the Soviets. It wasn't the decision to not continue the Bay of Pigs. The main reason they killed him was what you just said, because he was going to take the power away from the money changers. That's what I heard. In fact, I'll mail you a uh, Lincoln Greenback. I'll take it. <laughs> That's when he got Lincoln killed. Uh, the Rothschilds and others came to him and said, we'll loan you money at 30% interest to fight the, the, the war, which they were financing in the South for the British to destabilize the country. This is all in mainline history, but not mm -hmm. popularly taught. And he said, no way, I'll just start issuing our own money again. And so as soon as the war ended, they killed him over that again. So that's why it's called the Lincoln Greenback, because that was the last time it's since happened. Andrew Jackson that mm -hmm. money had been issued. So he didn't have to go get a law passed. Kennedy could say, well, as president, I can reissue any currency that's already been out there. Mm. And that got him killed. But I don't want to sit here and give a history lesson. But no, that's good, because right. it'll probably end up in a song. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> wow. Pick of the Week by the Dallas Observer uh, for all the concerts going on in Dallas. Uh, and it's uh, Justin's Pick of the Week. And he says, Megadeth, who recently put out their masterwork with Endgame, a relentless assault on corruption, FDIC, the banks, military occupations, and the mind scramble of today's world gone insane. With Dave Mustaine's articulate and spiteful delivery and blistering spiteful. guitar work. <laughs> Maybe you need to be spiteful. Yeah, I guess. Uh, on the other... And, and it just goes on from there. I mean, is that an accurate kind of snapshot of the album? I, I, I don't agree with the spiteful part, but yeah, I think so. I think so. I, it's certainly about the topics, you know, you can, but I think any 10-year-old any can read the lyrics and say that's what this is all about. And it, it's much more deeper than that. Each one of those songs is, uh, it, it is about those things, but it's so much more deeper. It's not like me just sitting on the fence and casting aspersions. It's really getting into the game and saying, this is what it feels like to take a hit. You know what I mean? Um, I know from firsthand with being involved in, in the money business, when I went to school to be a stockbroker, there's, there's, you know, there, there's things that, I learned about money that, you know, they just don't teach people and they want to keep people stupid. So, you know, I, I had that song, um, uh, The Right to Go Insane, and um, that song, um, there's, it, it, those lyrics are actually toned down because I went naming people's names and all kinds of stuff like that in the first version of it. So wow. that demo tape, if it ever gets circulated, it'll probably make a lot of people pissed. We figure the songs out while we're here. Um, when we, we do something like this, we get the song in pieces. Like, this is the rhythm track. I have to learn it again because I, last time I played it was in the studio. And then get like the solos.
the solo sounds like soloed out. Another solo. Dave solo. No Chris solo there. Here's another one. back and forth over it until you figure it out so and then the whole thing sounds like this I feel right now we're sitting on some of the uh, we definitely are on the quintessential lineup and, and I think that my songwriting hasn't even been tapped yet because of what just happened with our new guitar player Chris coming in Chris is a, a genius and he's an unrealized talent and it's real easy because that you know if you go over and you scratch him he kind of like bleeds music and, and so that was really cool for me we had a ballad on the record called the hardest part of letting go I wrote about me and my wife Pam she hates the song consequently because <laughs> the second half <laughs> is about Edgar Allan Poe you know uh, the Casco Montiato where he takes uh, uh, what's the guy's name? Fortunato down into the cellars and he bricks him into the wall. He's mirroring into the wall. I put that in the lyric and my wife thinks I want to brick her into a wall somewhere. So she didn't <laughs> like the song. But, um, you know, we wrote that and, and Chris actually contributed on that and it went from being a, a good song to being something that was really a masterpiece. And um, I don't say that because I was involved in it. I say that because the song really is that way. I used to listen to it. I would get really emotional because of what it meant for me with my, my finding my soulmate. And, and um, and as soon as she said she didn't like it, I couldn't stand hearing it anymore. So uh, i gotten over that, and I like listening to it again. But you know, to know that we have this potential as a guitar team and that we can uh, get into some really mind-blowing stuff. Because when Chris came in, you know, a lot of the stuff was already written. We haven't had a chance to really explore what all his talents are yet. <laughs> Cover. Yeah, um, it's it, well. Obviously, those are the FEMA coffins that everybody's talking about being in the Midwest, and and I haven't seen them myself, but um, you know I've seen pictures, and and um, you know we had this symbology that was like the uh, Hebrews being marched through the Red Sea, and uh, all the people that are in the Homeland Security jumpsuits with the uh, barcode on their head. You know, it doesn't say in the Bible if the barcode's going to be going this way or if it's going to be going this way. So I figured, you know, we would do something kind of like some cool imagery stuff, you know. That way the satellites can see it from on top. Maybe, yeah, perhaps. Um, but uh, I, I thought about that. How, how can we make this kind of look cool? We'll make it look like a mohawk, but then when you zoom in on it, it's actually their barcode. And um, we uh, put around the surrounding parts of it because, you know, I was, I was really, when I got saved, I really wanted to know what I was doing. You know, I didn't want to just blindly say, okay, I'm a Christian now. What do I do? Okay, 10%. Okay, good. See you later. You know, whatever. So I actually really read uh, a lot of the Bible and, and stuff. And one of the things that I noticed was in the story back um, with the Egyptians and stuff that out of all the plagues that happened, one of them was with the flies. And the flies got on everybody except for the Hebrews. And um, it was just really I insane to see that the chosen people had been left out of this really vile plague that had happened. And, and it was just one, one thing that just kind of went around the outside of the picture. So in the top of it, there's kind of like a stargate kind of sunburst there where people are going off to this light that they're being let off like, come to the light in, in uh, what is the Poltergeist movie. It's really a bug zapper. <laughs> <laughs> With the rest of the record, you know, when you look inside of it, there's, there's a lot of other stuff in there, like uh, the symbology with... We've got the one person who's covered in flies, which, you know, kids kind of gravitate towards that kind of artwork. They like stuff that's like that, you know, graphic stuff. And, and we've got other pictures of Vic actually pulling the hood off of this person and showing that, you know, he's actually a victim. And, and you know, he's either, either Vic is saving him or, or not, you know. And I look at it like this. He's kind of like saying, what are you doing under there? Let's get out of this situation. 
you know, I consider myself to, to be uh, um, alone as far as, you know, in, in our genre with people who really are willing to go out and stand on a limb and, and say, you know what, you can hate me if you want, but at the end of the day, I'm going to do what's right. Because doing what's right isn't popular. It's not. And, and that's why people, you know, they, they like to take pot shots at me. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, I do a lot of stuff that, that I know I'm not going to have any conscious, that I'm not going to have any problems with myself when I go to sleep at night. You know, because I see people do stuff and they compromise themselves and they, they sing songs and they think that they're not going to affect them. You know, you say that stuff and it comes out of your mouth and it, you, you portray that stuff to other young minds and they hear that stuff, they believe that. You know, I don't want to be responsible for making anybody stumble. I want to make sure that they become better people. In the final equation, you've you've spoken about a transformation or an awakening. Can you tell us? Was that overnight, or was that a process, or was that just going back to something you were at your core? I mean, can you speak about uh, you know the 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 changes in your life? Yeah, it, it was pretty simple. I've always believed in God. That's why you know the first line of peace sells. But who's buying says, "What do you mean? I don't believe in God." I talk to him every day. You know, when I was a kid, I was baptized as a Lutheran when I was four, and my mom had become a Jehovah's Witness when I was seven, and that just totally ruined my life. And then by the time I turned 15, I was so full of bitterness and, and just hatred for organized religion that I got into black magic and, and went down the route of the occult. And although I didn't pursue being a Satanist, you know, I was very much uh, agnostic and probably more atheist than I was anything because I just didn't want, I, I just didn't want to believe anymore because I was so spiritually abused. So when the time came when my arm had gotten destroyed in 2002, um, I had a terrible nerve damage to this hand and oddly it was this one. Anything else would have happened to my body, I could have had a leg cut off and I still would have kept playing. But my, my money maker here stopped working. I had to go, okay, what am I doing wrong here? Because there was a lot of stuff that was going on. And I was on a hill and I saw a cross and I looked at it and I just went, what have I got to lose? I've tried everything else. What have I got to lose? Six simple words and I became a Christian and, and I see the people that people don't like that are the hypocristians. You know what I mean? That's a good term. Yeah, I made that up. So um, I, uh, I just, I look at that and I'm, I, I'm not attracted to that and, and I see people that gravitate towards me, towards my family. They want to be with us because they know that they can say certain hard luck stories and we'll feel sorry for them. Yeah, you know, I'll feel sorry for you but you ain't getting it. You know, unless it's real, they're not getting in. Megadeth Radio is, is a non-stop heavy metal, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and, and except for the Halloween show we put on and the Christmas music we're going to be adding uh, towards around Christmas time, um, it's just standard heavy metal classics that, that I like. A couple of zingers, weird stuff like, you know, B.B. King and Muddy Waters and some old stuff like that, like Stevie Ray Vaughan and some of the blues that inspired me. And then some of the older stuff that I, I liked as a kid growing up, Elton John, Led Zeppelin, uh, the Beatles and stuff like that. But you, you know, you'll also see bands like Gore there, and that's not one of my favorite bands. I don't, I don't like them at all. But you know, the other guys in the band do. You know, there's there are bands that the other guys have picked that they like, and it's a it's a Megadeth station. It's not a Dave Mustaine station. Although you know, I did a lot of the work in the beginning. We're all participating now, and and I think you can tell because the the playlist is so eclectic. You can listen to that all day long, and and you'll discover all kinds of great new music. else you'd like to add to the audience out there? I love you. You can believe it all. <laughs> Dave Mustaine, thank you so much for talking to us. You're welcome, Alex. Appreciate God it. bless you, buddy. You bet. Kiss me in my brain.
Yes, Lynn, the chick ships. <laughs> 